Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Mick West. My guest today is Peter Berggren. Peter is CNN's National Security Analyst, a Vice President at New America, a Professor of Practice at Arizona State University, and host of the Audible podcast, In the Room with Peter Berggren. He recently interviewed Sean Kirkpatrick, who is the former head of the Pentagon's UFO Investigation Office. We're going to have a chat about UFOs, national security, self-licking ice cream cones, and aliens. Okay, Peter. Well, thank you very much for for doing this. This is going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, yeah. Your podcast uh, in the room with Peter Berger, and you've got thirty eight episodes so far. Episode three was about UFOs, about the Pentagon's investigation of UFOs. Episode thirty eight, the most recent one, was an interview with Sean Kirkpatrick, the former head of Arrow, the Pentagon's uh, uh, a UFO investigation body, and you just published a uh, an opinion piece on CNN on on this topic, basically recapping. Uh, your interview with Kirkpatrick and uh, adding a bit more information and your your opinions. So my question here is, um, you've given this quite a lot of attention uh, in over the last year or so. Is this, yeah. in your opinion, uh, an important topic or just an interesting topic? I think it's both. I mean, judging by, I mean, you write and uh, about this a lot. Um, you know, they're very strongly held opinions uh, about this issue, which makes it interesting. Um, and it's certainly important if the United States doesn't understand un unidentified flying objects over its territory, whether those are Chinese spy balloons or, um, you know, the very, I mean, as you know, the Department of Defense has investigated quite a number of these, and, and typically they're balloons, which are all, all obviously problematic for commercial and uh, flights but also uh government uh flights they are uh, and you know it's it is a national security issue because if the united states doesn't understand what's going on um above its head or even below the waters because i mean they're under I, as my as i understand it some of the efforts are also directed underwater um in terms of trying to detect ufos um, or uaps um so i think it's both so is this how you kind of got interested in it? Because you know, you are the national security analyst at CNN. Is this uh, your perspective on it? Is it a national security issue? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I think broadly speaking, yeah, that's how I, uh, yeah, I didn't really pay much attention to it until the New York Times piece of 2017. Right. Uh, that's what drew my attention to it. Um, and then I kind of filed it away. And then Eric German, who's uh, the producer who worked on the on the podcast, He's had a strong interest in it, and uh, that's why we uh, did our one of our first episodes on it, um, and that's when we interviewed you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Chris Mellon, who's obviously uh, kind of a more on the, uh, seems to believe that there are, you know, he, he's certainly not dismissing the idea that aliens are, have, have visited us as far. I don't want to summarize completely what he says for him, because I don't, I don't speak for him, but I mean, He's clearly somebody who was at a senior level at the Department of Defense, uh, who firmly believes that there seems to be evidence not just of things we can't explain, but perhaps of alien life. Um, and that's also what makes it interesting because Chris Mellon had a pretty senior job on the um, in the House in in the in the U.S. Congress and then also at Department of Defense. And uh, he has a certain point of view, um, and um, so. Again, that also makes it interesting. I think that uh, there are strongly held views on both sides, and, and no one can say for certain um, that the other side is completely wrong. Yeah, they can yeah. say the evidence suggests they're wrong, but I mean, we just, I mean, there's there's certain part. I mean, we've talked about this before, and you actually corrected me when I, we talked about Occam's razor because I think a lot of people think of Occam's razor as the simplest explanation is the best explanation, both as a philosophical and scientific matter. But that is actually a little bit of a caricature because really, as you pointed out, Occam's razor is every time you add a new piece to the theoretical construct, you're, that actually makes it less likely in the absence mm -hmm. of explanations of being correct. And obviously extraterrestrial life visiting us is a pretty giant piece to add. Uh, yes. to <laughs> 
it, it sounds like a simple explanation when you say, oh, they're, they're just uh, alien ships. But that, of course, posits an entire civilization of alien beings, which is a rather a large uh, assumption to make. So it, it is actually a lot more complicated uh, than it yeah, seems. Yeah, and I think I think Occam, um, you know, I, I I I think he would agree. I mean, we can't talk to him now because I think he was a sixth century Irish monk. Uh, but this, but <laughs> but this general principle has been around for. A, quite some period of time. So when you spoke to Kirkpatrick, uh, he describes a story that he's been hearing, uh, essentially about what he thinks is going on and how this all arose uh, within the Pentagon about essentially a, a small group of people. Can you describe the, the broad strokes of that story? Yeah, well, what, what I mean, to me, the and also to Eric, of the producer of the show, um, the thing that he said that seemed kind of the most novel, which has been hinted at by other people, maybe also including you, but also Gideon Lewis Krauss, who wrote in The New Yorker about this, um, you know, there's a relatively small group, what Kirkpatrick says, a dozen people, mostly in the government or close to it, and you know, famously Senator Harry Reid, who was the U.S. Uh, Senate Majority Leader, um, who very much in a position to you know get things done in the government. I mean, he, um, if you look at the the, the FOIA uh, DIA, uh, in fact, it was a sole bid. It appears to um, his friend Bigelow to look into this for twenty two million dollars. Um, so, you know, Kirkpatrick says that it's basically this kind of top secret game of telephone where here people are. I'm, I'm characterizing what he's saying. I'm not quoting him directly. Um, and, you know, people keep hearing bits and bobs of it. They don't really have any direct evidence of anything that's been positive, but they do know that there are secret compartmented programs which are looking into it, which are then used as evidence, well, if these programs exist, then the things that they're looking for must also exist, i.e. Um, alien spacecraft and the like. Um, and so I think that what, that, and of course, I think you, Mick, you would have seen his P, uh, Kirkpatrick's piece in Scientific American, yes. which was less elaborate than uh, this rather extended interview he gave us. But I think it came to some of the same conclusions. Yeah. Uh, yeah Kirkpatrick is an interesting guy. Uh, he, one thing that kind of came across is that it, it didn't really seem like this is a job he wanted to do. Not uh, at all. But he said, you know, basically he was voluntold, uh, to use a, a U.S. military term, <laughs> as he was preparing to retire. And he didn't, yeah, I, I think he'd lived his life, um, you know, very much with no media exposure, uh, avoiding the media at all costs. And suddenly he's thrust into this quite prominent role, which obviously subjected him to quite a lot of public scrutiny. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he's a, he's a, a, a PhD in physics. He's speciality is lasers he was sort of ideally cast for the job in many ways he was the chief of the Department of defense intelligence agencies um, you know one of their main kind of key sort of classified programs so you know he understands the department of defense and uh, that world and also is a physicist so um he I think he he seemed like an ideal person to take the job yeah, yeah. He, he think he was. He said he was kind of picked based on his experience of standing up organizations, meaning setting up an organization uh, in the past, and also with his technical knowledge. Uh, it seems he, you know, he actually set up the organization. Um, but you know, did you get a sense of from talking to him if he feels happy with the results of that organization, specifically the various investigations uh, that have been done? He didn't seem to, I, we didn't, I, happy didn't seem the word that, I, I feel like he was given this job. He's produced a report, which will come out later this month, theoretically, okay. which is a report to Congress, which is an, an, an exploration of all the history going back to Roswell. And, you know, the government did a fairly deep dive on many of these incidents and came up with these conclusions, which... You know, the big one, of course, is no evidence of aliens or alien spacecraft. Um, so, I mean, he didn't, I think happy is not the adjective I would use. I think he was tapped to do the job. He did the job. Um, he produced the report he was tapped to do. And, you know, then he he's, he's he retired. Yeah, yeah. And some of the, the, the report, you know, as you say, it goes back to Roswell. 
which seems like, do we really need another report on Roswell? I mean, wasn't this really covered before in previous government investigations? Is well, I, I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, you know many more of the facts than I do. I mean, yes. I mean, some of the, you know, there have been government investigations, but I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the mandate from Congress was twofold. One, historical, go back and look at all these reports and sort of come back to us with a report about, you know, these sightings. And two, sort of operational, which is to kind of encourage people within the Department of Defense to come forward with reporting of UFOs, UAP, however you want to describe them, and as much data as possible to support it. So it has this historical mission, then it also has this operational mission. Um, and yeah. it was doing both at the same time. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I guess they overlap at some point, uh, your historical stuff be abuts the the current thing and you get into the more recent cases. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people in the UFO community have kind of expressed disappointment that they haven't actually addressed uh, some of the, the more significant cases like Gimbal and uh, GoFast, you know, the, this rotating thing on the screen and the... Uh, and uh, I guess they did talk about the Nimitz case, but essentially they said they didn't have enough information. Yeah, apparently, you know, I mean, that was now back, what, it, um, two decades. And so yeah, you know, they, while there is the eyewitness testimony of the pilots, there isn't, uh, as I understand it from, from what Kirkpatrick said, that they didn't retain any kind of like radar tracks or the kinds of, uh, it, is, it doesn't exist. And so... Yeah. It's hard. It's a. It's hard to investigate something that happened 20, 20 years ago uh, when you don't have the data. Now, one thing Arrow, which is the office that Kirkpatrick was running, is trying to do and is encouraging the rest of the government, uh, the rest of DoD, to do is to is to retain data uh, when the, these kinds of incidents, which I think is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to play a real quick clip, part of your your podcast, and this is uh, Kirkpatrick talking about. Uh, well, it's probably just play. There's some of the same people that worked for Robert Bigelow under the DIA program. There's some of the same people that have uh, been working behind the scenes with Congress to write legislation. They're the same people that worked with a U.S. company and the United States Army to explore a piece of material that they claimed was a UAP, and it really is a piece of missile casing from the 1950s. They're the same people that have been influencing some of these whistleblowers who have come forward to say, hey, I don't have any firsthand evidence, but all these people are telling me this. Here's what I know. So that seems like a big deal. Uh, yeah. You know, I was trying during the interview, I was trying to kind of come up with the best metaphor for what this is. And I, I realized there's a great deal department Pen Pentagon speak term, which is a self-licking ice cream cone, which is Pentagon speak for something that exists to perpetuate itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it seemed to me that this system that Kirkpatrick was describing was a self classic self licking ice cream cone in Pentagon speak, because it was sort of the same set of people who were kind of generating these programs that were looking at things and then people would hear about aspects of this and, and then if sort of like the Chinese whispers would pick up and, and it, it would become established fact that you know, that there were these secret programs looking into it, which therefore showed that the thing they were looking into actually probably existed, as opposed to just, the, yeah, there were these covert programs that were finding nothing, according to Kirkpatrick. Yeah, and it, but it seems and like... Course, the other thing about it, the other, the other thing about it is you, you or I and 99% of people if, who are listening to this don't have top secret clearances yeah. or don't have... Uh, top secret clearances with special access programs, which are even harder to get, just to certain. Uh, um, and so you you're in the position, sort of like at the beginning of the Iraq War, where the only you can't really disprove that Saddam has weapons of mass destruction, except by you know invading the country and and finding that there were none. And I mean that's an inexact analogy, but the point is is that people in Arrow who are doing these investigations had the right clearances to find out what the hell was happening inside these programs. And they're saying there wasn't any evidence, and that's what Kirkpatrick is saying. Of yeah. course, I, it's going to be impossible, my guess is, is that, as Kirkpatrick himself says, it doesn't really matter what he says or does or whatever, what evidence he produces. 
it's not going to sway certain people for whom this is a theological kind of form of belief. Yeah, well, I guess it doesn't matter too much about swaying, say, UFO Twitter. I mean, the issue here yeah. is that there's people in the Pentagon who are be who have believed these things. It seems you know very significant that you know this is happening and legislation is being written because of this, and millions of dollars are being spent on task forces and various organizations are are being created. Well, seems like there should I mean, be some kind of mechanism <laughs> to prevent things like this well but i mean the counter argument is it is you know i mean it's, it is is as we sort of just dis, sort of discussed a little bit earlier i mean it is the united states needs to understand what's flying around in its airspace mm -hmm. particularly if it's not been identified and so if there's a there seems like a very sound reason to investigate everything uh with an yes. open mind and um i mean that is i think so I, there is a much more robust approach to this issue in the last, you know, so I don't think it's a waste of money because I, I don't know what the budget of Arrow is, but my guess is it's a rounding error in terms of the DOD budget. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and the DOD came out with this report, uh, I think they released it yesterday or maybe this morning, I can't remember. Uh, yes, and they basically said that, um, you yeah, know, the, the DOD and the branches of the, of the DOD, the, mili the um, Army, the Air Force and the Navy, should be doing a better job of investigating UFOs and they should be doing a better job of coordinating with each other. Uh, so I guess that's speaking to the real issues there of like, you know, we do actually see unidentified objects in our airspace and we need to address them. Uh, but it, it almost seems like there's two parallel things going on here. On one side, there's this kind of almost like slightly spooky thing with uh, people talking about being some other dimensions and you know, consciousness and things like that. And then on the other side, we've got nuts and bolts, but there seems to be a significant overlap uh, of those two things going on. Well, I read the IG report this morning and, um, you know, like a lot of inspectors, inspectors general, it says things like there needs to be better coordination. We need to be doing a better job. And I'm sure that's all true. It doesn't mean that there isn't a, you know, a fairly robust effort going on right now, because after all, uh, the Arrow office, which had a previous incarnation, uh, which I, as I understand it, never really got off the ground, but the yeah. Arrow office is an example of uh, the Department of Defense taking the issue far more seriously and putting resources into it. Now, the fact that the head of this office has come up with some conclusions that some people don't like, doesn't mean that they that the job is not being done. Yeah. Then you've got uh, uh, David Grush. Let me just play a quick uh, bit of audio. So he's one of the individuals that I think this this kind of this core group of people that have influenced him, have told him this information. He may have misinterpreted things that people have said, or he may have just fallen to the influence of what these folks have been telling him. So that's Kirkpatrick talking about Grush, uh, and he's saying that he might have just been influenced by these people. Uh, you know, it seems like, you know, it's a bit of a problem if we've got fairly high ranking intelligence officers uh, who basically believe in extraordinarily strange things, like about we've got recovered craft and we've got uh, craft that are bigger on the inside than the outside, and there's some kind of malevolent aliens, and they might be from other dimensions. Um, it's it it seems you know obviously the the real issues of ufos flying around are, are one thing uh but this this is is it is it a problem well i don't really want to comment on grush because a i don't know um i mean Kirkpatrick, i can't i i have no direct knowledge of what how he came to his conclusions um but i think we I, there's a Fair, there's a fair amount on the public record about Senator Harry, what Senator Harry Reid believed. Um, obviously, he's he's now dead, but uh, he spoke publicly on a number of occasions that that he clearly felt that this is an issue that was worth exploring. Um, and you know, is it a problem or not a problem? I you know, I I think if it if it has an outcome where we have a better sense of what's going on in in the world above us, that's a good outcome. Um, and if some people have beliefs that I don't personally share, um, based on, you know, I mean, I'm just following, if you look at, we not, it's not just obviously Kirkpatrick's interview that, but, um, there've been a number of reports which have come out and, you know, most of these UFOs are 
benign, have benign explanations. Um, I mean, at one point, Kirkpatrick in our interview said that there are 10,000 balloons released a day in the United States, which is an extraordinary number. You know, quite a number of them are weather balloons and some of them are party balloons. Um, and getting a handle on all that is, I think, useful. And, you know, I just personally, I don't share the conclusions that this is proof of something that uh, of some kind of alien spacecraft. I mean, if if the proof is for if the evidence is forthcoming, I'm I'm, I'm just not like I'm close minded, but sure. The burden of the burden of proof is is on the people who are saying that these are alien spacecraft, not on people who are saying these are generally speaking commercial drones, weather balloons, uh, uh, you know, rivals uh, aircraft and or secret U.S. aircraft that um, people are mistaking for something that that, that it isn't. Yeah, yeah, and certainly like everything that we actually resolve turns out to be something uh, fairly mundane, and the rest seems to be just simply lacking information. Um, but, uh, a lot of people in UFO Twitter were unhappy with your interview, and they were unhappy with the CNN uh, uh, um, op-ed that you wrote. Uh, then they they say that you know you're basically being fed information by the Pentagon, like you're a, a Pentagon shill, and uh, does does the Pentagon? Well, uh, talk to you in mean, a back channel uh, way to no, no no i mean in this case the pentagon uh we at one point went through the pentagon spokes spokesperson uh to request an interview with kirkpatrick that yielded nothing and then when P kirkpatrick retired we reached out to him independently of the pentagon the pentagon's had absolutely nothing to do with this right. uh, and you know uh this they would there's no reason to involve them because kirkpatrick's retired and we reached out to him and said, "Hey, would you like? Could you do? Would you be interested in doing an interview?" He said, "Yes." So there's no, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to interview him. <laughs> it would be interesting. <laughs> um, I think that would be an it, interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the the Pentagon, like, would you say there are competing factions within the Pentagon? Well, I mean. I did. I don't know enough to say that there is like you know competing factions, but clearly, I mean, you mentioned um, David Grush, who has one view, and right. then you Sean Patrick. So I mean, clearly, these these two have completely opposite views about this about this issue. You know, the, I doubt that you know the Pentagon is two million plus people. It's the world's largest employer, actually. <laughs> You know, I mean, the number of people who are interested in this subject inside the Pentagon is probably not very large as a percentage of the people who work there. Um, but, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. I think there may be up to four million. I, the point is millions of people work yeah, with the contractors with, as well. Probably. Uh, with, with the Pentagon as civilians, there are two million people on the active duty, reserves, National Guard. You know, this is a huge institution. So the number of people who are sort of focused on a on this issue is relatively small, um, and are there competing factions? I, I don't know if that's a fair description. There certainly seems to be some disagreement between, yeah. between particular individuals. But that yeah. said, Grush, I mean, uh, you know, the, the reports that have come out are the official pe Pentagon reports. I mean, presumably lots of people signed off on them at various levels, um, and it's a group uh, official report. It's not one person's opinion. So, right. um, you know, Kirkpatrick, the report that he is going to come out later this month, supposedly that is to Congress, is not it's not just his view or opinion. It's based on probably a lot of people um, kind of a, a hundreds of sightings and different and then lots of interviews and then lots of people who actually wrote the report. But no, there was no coordination with the Department of Defense. And right. That. Yeah, well, that's... Uh... Of course, no one's going to believe you, but uh, <laughs> what can you do? I mean... <laughs> uh, so this report, you said it's coming out later this month. Uh, is, that, is that going to be delivered to the to Congress, or is that going to be the public version of the report? I, but, I think it's going to be delivered to... It's a it's a congressionally authorized report. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because I think I sometimes they get the there's classified version first, and then it takes a oh, while yeah, for the public version to come out. Yeah, there may be. I don't know. I don't know. As we'll see. Uh, so, I, looking forward, like, what do you think is going to happen in the future? There's kind of like two ways this can go. I mean, the most unlikely way is that we 
David Gresh has proven to be correct. There is actually a reverse engineering program and we have these these flying craft. Or he's not going to be proven correct and uh, you know we're just going to continue on as we were before. But are we actually going to make progress? Like, how is it going to play out either way? Like, if there was evidence, what do you think are the steps that would actually lead to that evidence being uncovered? And conversely, if there isn't, what's going to happen over the next, say, five years uh, in terms of this story and how it plays out in, in the Pentagon and in the media? Well, I mean, this is where we get into philosophy rather than um, because, you know, Karl Popper, you know, he talked about falsifiable claims and non-falsifiable claims, also a sort of a, and a falsifiable claim is something that isn't theological in nature. And the problem about being visited by aliens is it's a bit of a non-falsifiable claim. Therefore, it's a branch of theology. Now, you know, I'm, it, it could turn into, it could be, it could turn into a branch of, of science. If we suddenly had the, you know, the aliens were among us, we, we had actual evidence, but we don't. What we have is supposition. So that's a non-falsifiable claim. So if you take Karl Popper to be largely to be correct about this issue, non-falsifiable non -falsifiable claims are not scientific. They are essentially theological in nature. Mm -hmm. I don't see, you're asking what's going to happen in the next three to five years. I don't see anything really changing. Because yeah. if you happen to have this belief, it's a belief, um, and beliefs like this are not, they're non-falsifiable. I mean, it's yeah. like simple. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, like no, <laughs> no evidence will come forward, and that won't change anything. I'll, so I'll give you an example of a non-falsifiable claim that was completely different, but we hear a lot mm -hmm. of right now. Is this which is around the question of getting people back in the office, the return to office? So Jamie Dimon, the head of you know, who's obviously a major figure in the banking world, has said that you don't if people don't come into the office, you know, spontaneous idea generation just doesn't happen at home. Right. Well, that's a non-falsifiable claim. Um, you just you can argue about it all you want, but it's not falsifiable. So therefore, it's sort of a form of theology. And um, there's no evidence, there's no empirical evidence that people think any better at home than they do at the office or vice versa. Uh, but anyway, that's that's why I don't see, I, I mean, I'm kind of question back on you, Mick. I mean, do you think this changes anything in terms of the big, the, because you, you've been investigating this for a long time? Yeah, I, I, I don't think anything's going to change unless some actual confirming evidence comes out. Uh, we're, we're going to get more and more uh, essentially evidence that doesn't really say anything. If if you find more uh, videos turning out to be birds or whatever, then it's not really going to change people's minds because there's always going to be other things that they, you know, like in the low information zone that they can't uh, identify. So, uh, yeah, I think, but, you know, I guess my question is more about you know, not that so much like what's going yeah. to happen in in kind of government uh, and in the military we're going to get oh. these uh, more organizations oh. stood up better better procedures well we asked a version of that to to <clears throat> to sean kirkpatrick which is like you know is there a danger by having this office and in a sense you're sort of feeding the you know you're just kind of kind of bringing more attention to this issue and kind of amping it up and you know he said that you know they had a lot of debates about that you know obviously they feel that they're doing the best job they can and etc and the this is a congressionally authorized office and uh, the money is there but i am i you know in the overall i think the fact that arrow exists is a really good thing for yeah. the reason we've already discussed uh because whether it's a you know whether you're flying coach uh to miami or whether you're flying in a f-16 you don't really want unidentified flying objects <laughs> yes, <laughs> moving indeed. around in American airspace. And um, so from a, you know, from a national security and sort of human safety point of view, this is a very good, it's a, this is, I, I think it's good that the Pentagon's really investigating this and putting a, a real, a real effort into it. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I do agree. Uh, I mean, I think it's something that's kind of been overlooked, really, and that the stigma of UFOs has kind of perhaps contributed to a, a bit of a lack of uh, flight safety, whereas we really should have been looking into some of these cases to figure out what they are, even if they knew they're probably not aliens, but something is happening, pilots are making mistakes, or there are things in the air that uh, are an issue. So, yeah. Uh, so, 
for you personally, like, uh, are you going to continue looking into this subject or unprofessionally? Are you going to keep, uh, keep well, an eye on it? I think so. Your plans? I think so. I think so. I mean, because I think, you know, the, uh, we know, there now seems to be a fairly regular cadence of official publications on this, and that they're always pretty interesting. Um, and I'm certainly going to be, uh, you know, looking out for them when they get published. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a very interesting subject. Yeah, well, I'm certainly going to keep uh, looking into it. <laughs> I find it extremely <laughs> interesting. <laughs> All right, Peter. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, mate, this, is, for the this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some interesting feedback on it <laughs> online. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you very All much. Right. Mate. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye.